This video will explore a new paper from researchers at Google AI that compares supervised pre-training, self-supervised pre-training, and self-training. Self-training is a new paradigm that achieved the state-of-the-art in ImageNet classification in self-training with noisy student. Self-training works by first training a model on the labeled dataset, then using that model to label an unlabeled dataset producing pseudo-labels, then combining these datasets together to train a new model on the new combined dataset and continuing this process until the desired performance is achieved. Self-training is one way that we can use extra data to get better performance in the task of interest. Our unlabeled dataset is usually much larger than the labeled dataset. The researchers show that self-training outperforms supervised or self-supervised pre-training with respect to stronger data augmentations and more labels in the downstream task of interest. I also thought this paper was really interesting because it shows how self-training looks for object detection and semantic segmentation. This video will explore rethinking pre-training and self-training. This video will explain rethinking pre-training and self-training from researchers at Google AI, exploring many different ways to make use of extra data, whether it's labeled or not. This paper is addressing the question of how do we use extra data, whether it's labeled or not, particularly for the downstream tasks of object detection where we assign a bounding box over an object of interest in an overall image, or semantic segmentation where we classify every single pixel in the image. So we'll start off with the clear supervised transfer learning. That would be where we take a model and train it on a large labeled dataset like ImageNet, and then we repurpose those features as the backbone for an object classification head to be trained on top of those features. Another technique is self-supervised learning. So here are two different ways of doing this. You could have a technique like SimCLR. SimCLR is a contrastive self-supervised learning algorithm, and it learns representations by making the representations of an image similar to a data augmentation view of that same image and dissimilar to all the other images in the training set or some uh, batch like the queue used in momentum contrast. So these contrastive self-supervised learning algorithms have been pretty successful with SimCLR version 2 coming out very recently as well. Another strategy for using self-supervised learning to leverage extra unlabeled data would be the strategy in ImageGPT, where you train a generative model on this massive unlabeled data set and then repurpose those representations to fine tune for say, ImageNet classification, or in this case, uh, COCO object detection or Pascal semantic segmentation. So the third technique that is gonna be shown to be very effective in this paper is self-training. Self-training was made really popular with the self-training with noisy student paper that achieves the ImageNet classification state of the art. So it's this technique that we're gonna describe in more detail in the next slide that uses the unlabeled data with the smaller set of labeled data simultaneously throughout training to improve upon the signal in the labeled data by leveraging the unlabeled extra data. This is the idea of self-training in the example of using the ImageNet dataset to help with training a object detection model on the COCO labeled dataset. So COCO is this dataset of images that have bounding boxes over objects like this bike. This example is semantic segmentation where we're labeling every pixel in the image as the semantic class like bike or background. So the first step of self-training is to take the larger dataset and if it's already labeled, like in the case of ImageNet, we throw away these labels because we're not gonna be taking this bike image and just mapping it to bike. We're gonna be trying to design the bounding box across the bike. So then we're gonna train the object detection model on the labeled COCO dataset. So then we take that model that was trained on the COCO dataset and we use it to generate pseudo labels on ImageNet. So this means taking each of the images in ImageNet and then putting them through a forward pass of COCO and having them come out with some pseudo labeled bounding box that this model has predicted on the image. So in the case of uh, semantic segmentation, you see the example of the model trained and the limited uh, labeled semantic segmentation data set and then it takes the ImageNet image and produces this new pseudo label for it. So then you're gonna aggregate the pseudo labels at this iteration step and the labeled data set and use that to train a new model that's been randomly initialized. So it's a bit more computationally expensive to do self-training with uh, these iterations of training the model, but it performs better than pre-training, either supervised pre-training or self-supervised pre-training. Another factor of the self-training pipeline, especially what's used in Noisy Student, which achieves the ImageNet state-of-the-art at 88.4% top one accuracy, is to inject noise when the model is pseudo-labeling the unlabeled dataset. So this noise can be in the form of doing data augmentations like rotations, translations, or color alterations to the unlabeled data image, 
or applying dropout in the model or stochastic depth, which is where you drop out an entire path of the network. So you integrate this noise with the prediction on the unlabeled data to add some more uh, robustness and add more signal with respect to applying these pseudo labels on the unlabeled data and then stacking these pseudo labeled data sets with the label data to train the next iteration of a model. These are some examples where the pseudo labels that come from the model trained on the limited data set is able to perform a more precise labeling of the image than the human labelers. In this bike image, uh, eating dinner image, and then this plant image, you see more precise labeling with the pseudo label from the previously trained model. And these are cases where the pseudo labeling fails. You see in the bear image, there's no highlight at all. It's just all black, as is the landscape image. And these other uh, landscapes aren't quite as uh, precise as the ones in this example. So we're comparing the self-training paradigm with supervised pre-training and self-supervised pre-training. So supervised pre-training describes pre-training the model on the ImageNet labeled data set, where we have the cross entropy loss over class predictions. And then we would fine tune these features on a downstream task like CIFAR 10 classification or COCO object detection slash Pascal semantic segmentation. So the next comparison is with self-supervised pre-training. So this is another really popular technique to make use of unlabeled extra data. So the first uh, class of techniques is contrastive self-supervised learning. So these are techniques like momentum contrast, contrast of predictive coding, and SimCLR. So SimCLR takes an image and then augments it to perform two views of that same image. And then the representation between these two augmented images are optimized to maximize their agreement. So there are all these other techniques that try to push representations of the same image and augmented views of it towards each other and then dissimilar from other images in the mini batch data set or Q as in the momentum contrast algorithm. So the next technique would be to train a generative model on this data and then repurpose that representation learned by the generative model for a downstream task like COCO object detection. So really famously, ImageGPT just released their paper with 6.8 billion parameters where they train this autoregressive pixel prediction model that can perform pretty well on ImageNet classification. Another way of doing self-supervised pre-training would be to construct an auxiliary or some kind of artificial supervised learning task, like rotating this image 0, 90, 180, or 270 degrees, and then predicting the rotation angle on the uh, made up task, and then using these representations to fine tune for cocoa object detection. The authors experiment with the retina net architecture. So the way that this works with say supervised pre-training or self-supervised pre-training is you will take this uh, feature backbone that takes in the raw image then extracts these levels of features and then you'll pipeline this into a feature pyramid network. These feature pyramid networks are used in object detection and semantic segmentation to get the multiple uh, resolution scales of the feature maps. Because convolutional networks, they downsample the uh, height and width of these feature maps as they go through the network. So this might be the 256 by 256 image net image, and this might be 128 by 128, 64 by 64, and then 32 by 32. So you use this kind of feature pyramid way of uh, going down and pooling the feature maps and the intermediate feature backbone to pipeline this into the classification head at the top that does the bounding box uh, regression loss on the coordinates of the bounding box, as well as the actual class like bike, elephant, or whatever it's trying to classify. So there's a lot of different architectures for object detection. Most recently, the debtor model from Facebook uses a set kind of loss function that's a lot different from this kind of paradigm with the transformer architecture, but this is the model architecture that's being explored in this paper, also similar to the efficient debt model. So the first set of experiments we'll look at are varying the amount of labeled COCO data. So this is the amount of labeled data for the downstream fine tuning task, and then the strength of the data augmentation used. So they're experimenting with data augmentations like simple flipping or things like auto augment or rand augment that have more sophisticated ways of scheduling the magnitude of data augmentations, like whether you're going to rotate it 50 degrees or say five degrees and scheduling how you're going to do that throughout the training. So they're comparing supervised pre-training with ImageNet, self-supervised learning, particularly with the SimCLR contrasted learning algorithm, and then the self-training algorithm described previously. The experiments are controlling for the amount of augmentation or regularizing noise that's used in the fine tuning, whether it's the simple flipping and cropping augmentation, using auto augment, large scale jittering plus auto augment, or large scale color jittering plus the RAND augment uh, automated scheduling algorithm differently from auto augment. So then with respect to the supervised pre-training uh, initializations, they experiment with a model initialized with random weights and RAND in it, ImageNet in it is a model that's been pre-trained with the auto augment and the ImageNet labels and achieves 84.5% top one accuracy on ImageNet and ImageNet++ in it 
is the model from Self-Training with Noisy Student that uses an additional 300 million images from the JFT dataset. So in ImageNet in it and ImageNet++ in it, they're controlling for the model capacity. These both use uh, the FishNet B7 or L2, not sure exactly the variant, but they're using the same model capacity and they're just controlling for how well the different models are performing at the pre-training uh, supervised learning task. The first set of experiments shows that supervised pre-training hurts performance when stronger data augmentation is used. So the purple chart is the random initialization, and then the orange is the image net with the self-training with noisy student weights at 87% accuracy, and the gray one is with 85% accuracy. So you see as more augmentation is being used, only the random initialization uh, model is really improving with the average precision metric compared to the supervised pre-training models. So at the small scale of data augmentation where you're just flipping the images, the efficient net with the 87% accuracy performs better than random initialization, but as you scale up, the random initialization performs better. And then this shows that once you increase more data, the pre-training with the supervised learning becomes completely useless. In the case of only 20% of the labeled COCO dataset for the downstream fine-tuning task, you get better performance with the 87% ImageNet accuracy uh, feature extracting backbone. But once you start adding more data, all these lines blur and become the same with the random, random initialization performing about better. The next table shows that self-training helps in these cases where strong data augmentation is causing the ImageNet pre-trained model with supervised learning to decrease performance even surpassing the random initialization. So this is the performance of the randomly initialized model as it starts to increase with more data augmentation and the supervised learning model starts to decrease or it still improves but not at the same pace of the random initialized model. But when you also do the ImageNet dataset for self-training, so you're fine tuning the randomly initialized model on the small labeled COCO object detection dataset and then you're treating the ImageNet dataset like it's a object detection dataset and you're labeling it artificially with the model trained on the subset of the COCO labels. And this is continuing to improve more so than the random initialization as you increase the strength of the data augmentation. This table shows that even when we're increasing the amount of labeled data for the downstream fine tuning task, self-training continues to improve the performance even with 100% of the labeled data set. Whereas the random initialization is starting to surpass the ImageNet supervised learning uh, pre-trained model to start out with. So we're seeing that self-training is additive to this uh, random initialization and continues to improve even when you add more labels for the downstream task. Self-supervised pre-training with the SimCLR contrastive representation learning algorithm also hurts in the case of the higher augment S4 data augmentation in a similar way as the supervised learning initialized weights. So we're seeing that only self-training is continuing to improve on the performance at the higher levels of data augmentation. The authors further investigate the gains that can be achieved with self-training and pre-training by using the open images dataset to do the self-training or have this unlabeled counterpart with the labeled data for COCO object detection and the Pascal semantic segmentation dataset. The authors further explore stacking these techniques together with joint training. So joint training would describe also doing the image classification and simultaneously passing the gradients through the object detection loss. So we see the baseline performance with just the supervised training where we just train with the uh, limited COCO data set and we're doing object detection. Then with self-training where we're doing the COCO classification and we're also using ImageNet as additional data to supplement our pseudo labels for the self-training pipeline. Joint training would describe simultaneously doing ImageNet classification with this feature backbone and doing the object detection. Now we can also do self-training and the supervised training and the uh, pre-training supervised training. So we could train this feature backbone on ImageNet classification. We can also get gradients through the limited COCO dataset, and we can still use this to do the pseudo labeling of the additional unlabeled data and use all these different multitask uh, tasks to perform the loss and update the network. The authors reason that the success of self-training is because it aligns the unlabeled data with the labeled data in task alignment. So previous studies showed that pre-training on the open images labeled, labeled images with bounding boxes doesn't necessarily improve performance on COCO. Even though they are the same task with the same kind of labeling, there still is this distribution correction with respect to the annotation that pseudo labeling helps to correct. Meta pseudo labels serves a similar purpose to correct the label distribution that the student network is learning on to align the task with the unlabeled data and the labeled data and to facilitate learning. 
So this is another interesting way of formulating this paradigm of having this pseudo label distribution. In the case of self-training, we're using the previous model to label the data. And in the case of meta pseudo labels, we're gonna use this gradient through a gradient meta controller operation to control the label distribution as well. Some of the key takeaways from the study are that supervised and self-supervised learning fail to scale as the labeled data set size grow, as we saw by going from 20% to 40% up to 100% of the data set, and it doesn't increase the performance while you're increasing the level of data augmentation, but self-training is still useful in these settings. But fine-tuning a pre-trained model is still faster than training from scratch and self-training. Self-training is this iterative algorithm where we're training a model from scratch, using it to label this unlabeled data set, and then training a new model on the combination of those two data sets. So that's more time consuming than say, fine-tuning a pre-trained model that's been trained with supervised learning or self-supervised learning. And they note that the speed up can range from 1.3 to eight times faster. The results from exploring pre-training and self-training show that we still don't have these universal feature representations or features that we can get by pre-training on ImageNet supervised learning, and then taking those features and using them for classification on a different image data set, bounding box detection, or say semantic segmentation. OpenAI recently explored the universal feature representation capabilities of a generative model with 6.8 billion parameters. They train this model to autoregressively predict the next pixel and do this at scale, and then try to take those representations and use them for ImageNet or CIFAR 100 classification. But even in this case, they don't surpass, say, the state of the art with supervised learning and things like self-training with Noisy Student on those data sets. So we still don't have this universal feature representation that we can get by leveraging extra data and then have this one almost operating system representation where we just take this representation and use it as features for all of our different downstream tasks. So it's kind of interesting to think about how we're going to fine tune representations, leverage pre-training and extra data. So one of my favorite papers is Poet. Poet is exploring this stepping stone curriculum as this bipedal walking agent controller learns how to control the walking agent across a really complex terrain with maybe all sorts of different bumps and ditches. And so this curriculum evolves to create this complex uh, controlling walking behavior. So I think it's interesting to think of these pipelines as we go from pre-training on maybe supervised learning, pre-training with self-supervised contrastive learning, generative modeling, all these different ways that we can think of chaining different tasks to learn these representations. Thanks for watching this overview of rethinking pre-training and self-training. Hopefully from this video, you got a sense of what self-training is and how it's different from supervised or self-supervised pre-training and how it's being adapted to do bounding box detection or semantic segmentation. This study shows that self-training is outperforming pre-training with respect to adding more data augmentation and more labeled data for the downstream fine-tuning task in the case of comparing it with supervised learning on ImageNet and self-supervised learning with the SimCLR framework. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos. Mm -hmm.